In the year 1110, a mysterious order called the Priory de Sion appeared upon the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. This mysterious secret order, the Priory de Sion, was eventually to crown the first king, the first Christian king of Jerusalem. When they appeared on the Temple Mount in 1110, they recruited nine knights to comb, to scour the Temple Mount, the passages and caverns and tunnels beneath, for the ancient remains of the relics of the religion. Later, in A.D. 1118, nine knights, supposedly concerned for the welfare of pilgrims to the Holy Land, bound themselves together in the creation of a knightly order. This order, again, existing of nine knights, just like the original nine knights, were commissioned by the Priory de Sion. In under 200 years, folks, this organization had become one of the most powerful single entities, if not the greatest power ever to exist in Europe. They were the first international bankers, the first that ever existed in the world. A few years later, it was utterly destroyed. They say, however, as you're going to find out, they were not destroyed at all, but merely driven underground. The zeal of religion, the conditioning which made men support a dedicated cause with all of their might, was likewise the instrument of their destruction. Nothing less than religious fervor could have smashed the order, as nothing less could have created it. And folks... You're going to find it difficult to believe, but the rise of this order and the destruction, at least publicly, of this order has such a great bearing on events today that you could say that everything that has happened since has been brought about by this one series of acts. Were the Knights Templar devil worshippers? Secret Saracens indulging in obscene orgies? Did they adore a head, spit on the cross, use the words Yala, which means literally in Arabic, O Allah, in their rituals? Did they learn their ways from the terrible sect of the Assassins? Well, yes, folks, they did. And they are the link at least in that day, would have been considered the modern link between the ancient mystery religion of Babylon and Europe. For the religion had come to Europe long, long before the Templars ever emerged and made their appearance in the ancient worship of the sun by the Druids and the Celts and the tribes, the Germanic tribes, who had made their way thousands of years ago from the Middle East up through Asia and across Russia and into Europe. They brought Mystery Babylon with them and practiced it as what we know now today as the pagan religion. And Stonehenge is actually an ancient Babylonian temple of the sun. And you will find how all this connects later. But the origin of this was lost, and the ability to control large numbers of people by the use of the hidden knowledge of the ages was lost. It wasn't until the Knights Templar bought and brought the mystery religion of Babylon to Europe that the ancient, ancient worship of the sun again took hold amongst the Christian countries in the guise of Christianity, which was itself, at that time, I'm not talking about the teachings of Christ, now I'm talking about the perversion of the teachings of Christ, the melding of the teachings of Christ with the ancient worship of the Son, the mystery religion of Babylon, which became the Catholic Church was indeed another branch of the ancient mystery religion of Babylon. 
that some of you out there may be confused from all of this. If you've been listening from the beginning of this series, then you're right on target. You're not confused. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Now, folks, the original objective of the Order of the Temple, the Knights Templar, which immediately became the subject of applause throughout Christendom, was to combine the two functions of monk and knight, to live chastely and fight the Saracens with the sword and spirit. The sweet mother of God, <clears throat> at least outwardly they say, was chosen as their patroness, and they bound themselves to live in accordance with the rules of St. Augustine, electing as their first leader Hugh de Payens. Now King Baldwin II granted them a part of his palace to live in, and gave them a grant towards their upkeep. Now the part of the palace that they lived in was actually an ancient mosque, which was built upon the actual location of the old Temple of Solomon on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. The Knights Templar vowed to consecrate their swords, arms, strength, and lives to the defense of the mysteries of the Christian faith, to pay complete and utter obedience to the orders of the Grand Master, to fight whenever commanded, regardless of pearls, for the faith of Christ as they understood it. Among the vows taken were those which forbade their yielding even a foot of land to the enemy, whoever the enemy was, and not to retreat, even if attacked, in the proportion of three to one. They chose the name Militia Templi Soldiers of the Temple, after the temple supposedly built by Solomon in Jerusalem, near which they had been assigned quarters by the king, but in reality had nothing to do with the Temple of Solomon. Some say that the Templars derived their idea of their order from that of the Hospitallers who looked after Catholic pilgrims to Palestine, for there was little hospitality to be had from the native Orthodox Christians of those parts. Others hold that there was an even older order from which they received their inspiration. No reliable evidence on this point is, however, available according to the, quote, establishment, unquote, historians. Although for those who really, really research the true history of the secret orders, and specifically the Knights Templars, there's a direct connection to the assassins and the Rosh Hashanah. Although the Templars were so poor that two men had to share a horse, they say, but that is not true at all, and their seal commemorated this decades after they became one of the richest communities of their time, they soon attracted favorable notice and support. Now, the two knights riding the horse was a symbol of sacrifice. It denoted their vows of poverty. In truth, each knight not only had a horse, but he had what they called a yeoman. He had a spare horse. He had a pack horse. And he had several horses in reserve. And a whole train of servants. But the Knights Templar were the first true, as we know it, in modern times. In modern times. There were others before. But they're the first true in modern times. By modern, I say from the time that Europe escaped from the old tribal paganism. In other words, in the year 1110, I consider that the beginning of the modern age, although historians may disagree with me, it's the beginning of everything that's ever happened since, and everything that's happening today can be traced right to the door of the Knights Templar. And that's why I say that. They were the first modern order to practice what we now know as true communism. They were the ones who brought international socialism into Europe, which has always been the tenet and the creed of the mystery religion of Babylon. Only one year after their establishment, Falk, Count of Anjou, who had come to Jerusalem on a pilgrimage, joined as a married member and gave them an annual grant of 30 pounds of silver. This example was soon followed by other devout Western princes. For the first nine years of their existence, the knights continued to live a life of chastity and poverty in accordance with their vows. 
They adopted a striped white and black banner called the Busan, after their original piebald horse, and this word also became their battle cry. Special raiment they had none, and they wore whatever clothes were given to them by the pious, but little by little, as one writer puts it, they were to become haughty and insolent. And the black and white banner, the translation of the meaning of which was for the, again, exoteric, for the real meaning of the black and white banner was the meaning of the androgynous God, the positive, the negative, the black and the white, the yin and the yang. The male and the female combined into one, and that was the real meaning of the black and white banner. And it's carried forth today on the floor of many of the temples of Freemasonry where the black and white checkered and pattern exists. And in one famous cathedral in Europe, built by the Knights Templar, they disguised their esoteric religion in an exoteric manner that would be accepted by Christianity. Baldwin of Jerusalem, who had been a prisoner in the hands of the Saracens and knew of their disunity, realized at about this time that Islam must eventually unite against the Christian invasion, and he decided that the Templars would prove ideal allies in the battles which were to come. In 1127, therefore, he sent two Templars with his strong recommendation to the Pope, applying for official recognition of the order by the Holy See. And this is the first time that the Templars even were considered to be close to the center of religion, the Christian religion in that day, the Catholic Church, the Pope. For they were not commissioned as a Christian order. They were not commissioned by the Pope or by the Church. And this is a big myth that the Knights Templars started out to protect the church and protect the pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem. They were established first, primarily, and foremost as a branch of the ancient order of the religion of mystery Babylon. And it's indicative of the strategies that they've used since to endear themselves to whatever the established power or the beliefs of the majority of the people might be. When they went to see the Pope, they had an introduction to St. Bernard himself, the abbot of Clairvaux, who was known to be an admirer of theirs and who was a nephew of one of their envoys. Then the Grand Master himself arrived in Europe and received the eulogistic opinion of the abbot. Quote, they go not headlong into battle, but with care and foresight, peacefully, as true children of Israel. But as soon as the fight is begun, they rush without delay upon the foe and know no fear. One is often put to flight a thousand, two, ten thousand, gentler than lambs and grimmer than lions. Theirs is the mildness of monks and the valor of the night." Unquote. Now, folks, this was a strong recommendation, and this testimonial was a part of the campaign to help the Templars in their efforts at recognition by the Pope. All of you who have thought that they began as a religious order in the first place are so way off base that it's pathetic. And neither were the Jesuits a religious order in the first place, but we'll get that together in another broadcast. But on the 31st of January in the year 1128, the Master appeared before the Council of Troyes. Now, this formidable body consisted of the Archbishops of Reims and Sins, ten bishops, and a number of abbots, including St. Bernard himself, presided over by the Cardinal of Albano, the Papal Legate. They were approved, and Pope Honorius chose for them a white mantle, Completely plain, the red cross was added by order of Pope Eugenius III in 1146. And see, you thought the Templars thought of this. Nope, not at all. This was mandated by two popes. First, a white mantle, completely plain, and then later, the red cross was added by order of Pope Eugenius III in 1146. 
Hugh de Payens now took his delegation through France and England and collected a number of recruits. Gifts and grants were showered upon the order. Lands, rents, and arms were forthcoming from all quarters. Richard I of England was enthusiastic about them. By 1133, King Alfonso of Aragon and Navarre, who had fought the Spanish Moors in 29 battles, had willed his country to them. Although when the Moors finally laid him low, his nobles prevented the Templars from claiming their rights, nevertheless, this was, was a great honor. In fact, to my knowledge and to our research into history, it had never before been done. In 1129, the master, accompanied by 300 knights recruited from the noblest houses of Europe, led a huge train of pilgrims to the Holy Land. It was at this time that the Templars formed part of the Christian contingent, which allied with the assassins tried to take Damascus. And it wasn't the first time nor the last that the Christian Knights Templar, or supposedly Christian Knights Templar, they really weren't Christian at all, were allied with the assassins. Were they, as the Orientalist von Hammer alleges, connected in some secret way with the assassins? Yes. Our research shows that it is a historical fact. And it is also an historical fact that the assassins were prepared to adopt Christianity if they could gain greater power thereby. Christianity, that is, on the surface, just as the Knights Templar had done. Hammer points to the similarity of the two organizations. The followers of Hassan, Ibn Sabah, were in contact with the Templars and had a similar method of organization. They were in existence before the Templars were formed. The Ishmaelites, the Ishmaelians, or assassins, was the original. And folks, the order of the Templars was the copy. The balance of Western opinion is against this contention more particularly because one feels from wide reading of historians great sympathy is felt for the cruel, cruelly treated and arbitrarily disposed Templars. Thus, Kitely, who made a close study of the order, attacks those who would claim that the Templars were an assassin branch, but when you do research into the <laughs> associations and memberships of Kitely, you'll find that Kitely was himself a Knight Templar. And he said, quote, When nearly 30 years after their institution, the Pope gave them permission to wear a cross on their mantle, like the rival Hospitaller Order, no color could present itself so well suited to those who daily and hourly exposed themselves to martyrdom as that of blood, in which there was so much of what was symbolical. With respect to internal organization at will, we apprehend, be always found that this is for the most part of the growth of time and the product of circumstances, and is always nearly the same where these last are similar, unquote. And you find this kind of rhetoric and semantics all through the writings of those who wish to cover the true origin and the true meaning of Mystery Babylon. The famous question of the 3,000 gold pieces paid by the Syrian branch of the assassins to the Templars is another matter, which has, of course, never been settled. One opinion holds that this money was given as a tribute to the Christians. The other, that it was a secret allowance from the larger to the smaller organization, which it really was, as the assassins wished to expand their control and remember their original goal was to take over the entire world by the systematic infiltration and control of each individual country. Those who think that the assassins were just fanatical Muslims and therefore would not form any alliance with those who to them were infidels should be reminded that to the followers of the old man of the mountain, only he was right, and the Saracens who were fighting the holy war for Allah against the Crusaders were as bad as anyone else who did not accept the assassin doctrine. And it is true today. Quote, if you are not one of us, you are nothing. Unquote. Quote, the ends justify the means. Unquote. Quote, the strength of our order exists in the fact 
that we manifest ourselves under many different names and many different occupations, and sometimes even seem to oppose ourselves. But at the highest level, we are of one mind, unquote. And I could go on and on and on, and you all know that I can go on and on and on. For I've studied this for so many years that I eat, drink, and sleep it. Oh, yes. Well, eventually grave charges against the Templars during the Crusades included the allegation that they were fighting for themselves alone. And more than one historical incident bears this out. The Christians had besieged the town of Ascalon in 1153 and were engaged upon burning down the walls with large piles of inflammable materials. Part of the wall fell after a whole night of this burning. The Christian army was about to enter when the master of the temple, Bernard de Tremelli, claimed the right to take the town himself. And this was because the first contingent into a conquered town had the whole spoils. As it happened, the garrison rallied and killed the Templars, closing the breach. There seemed good grounds for believing that the power which they had gained caused the Templars to devote their efforts as much as their own order's welfare as to the cause of the cross, in spite of their tremendous sacrifices for that cause. Having no loyalty to any territorial chief, they obeyed their master alone, and hence no softening political pressure could be put upon them. Well, this might well have led to an idea that they were an invisible super-state, and that is exactly the fact. But this does show some similarity with the invisible empire of the assassins. If none can deny their bravery, their high-handedness and exclusivity, and less than a hundred and fifty years after their founding gave them the reputation of considering themselves almost a law unto themselves. And now, dear listeners, we get into the meat the direct connection between the historical events and the events that are happening today. Don't miss even one episode of this series. Good night, and God bless each and every one of you. <laughs>